Those of you that uh, are from here, from the United States, you, you've, heard, uh, you've heard us talk about the work done in Australian rules football probably for the last few years. Um, the Aussie rules football analysts uh, are some of the best in the world, and they're some of the best sports code users in the world. And uh, sports code is littered throughout the league, I believe, every team now? Yeah, all 18 teams. So um, they're, they're nearing the end of their season now, too. There's a month left in the regular season, and then they enter their, their playoff period. And we're, we're fortunate enough to have five people from the AFL here. Could you guys all stand up? There's four in the audience still. Don't be shy. So I'd encourage you to at least exchange contact information. These guys are doing, wait, six people. Sorry, I didn't realize there were six people. So they're really good at what they do. Um, share your information with them. I think you'll, you'll uh, get, get a lot out of it. Colin Zamet is a football IT manager uh, for the Fremantle Football Club. He has uh, uh, been there for five years. He's, uh, the, the club is steadily improving, making the playoffs two of the last three years. His main role is to manage a team of performance analysts, the football department's IT infrastructure, and information management. And he's going to talk to you today about how Fremantle is developing an information management framework that's based around Sports Code version 9. I think it'll be a really interesting talk. So please welcome, Col welcome Colin Zamet. <clears throat> okay, so um, the initial title for my presentation was Inf Information by Design. But we thought it was a bit limiting on the stuff I wanted to talk about. So I'll get into actually what an information management framework is um, not too far into the presentation. Um, I just want to probably start off with an introduction about myself in the football club and where we've come um, with analysis since I've been at the club. Um, then I'll go into a bit about information management and what, it is, what a framework is, um, like where we've come from, the problems we've had to overcome, the common mistakes we make when analysing data, um, I'll define what the, the framework is that we've, we've um, come up with and how we use that, that framework. And we've come, come up with six stages of design that you, you go through when you have a concept of something you want to analyse to all the way through to how you, you actually go through for recording it to, to the analysis. And then a quick just go through a quick workflow of how, how that um, is implemented week to week. Um, so I started working for the Fremantle Football Club in January of 2009. Um, my job title is a football IT manager. Um, it doesn't really, the job title doesn't really indicate what my job is. Um, a bit of background, I, before working for the Fremantle Football Club, I was working in film production as a sound recorder and sound designer. Um, I studied mathematics and computer science straight out of university, then went on to, to study film. So before joining the Fremantle Football Club in, in um, January of 2009, I had no idea what performance analysis was, never seen sports code. I didn't even realise these jobs existed. If I knew earlier, I probably would have um, tried to get one of the jobs earlier. Um, but it's been, it's been a great journey and I found it really, really rewarding. It's, it's one of the, um, yeah, it's like I just have, it's, it's not really a job for me. It's, it's um, yeah, it's just, it's like, yeah, like a previous presenter said, it's, it's, a, it's awesome to get paid to, to work on your hobby. Um, so my, my job, my role has evolved. Um, I still look after a lot of the file servers, the, the network infrastructure, um, and the workstations, um, how we back up, when it gets backed up, information. Um, I'm trying to get out of that more and more, but unfortunately um, that's still part of my role. And I manage a, a team of performance analysts. We have, apart from where we have uh, four full-time analysts, three are dedicated to the AFL, um, one's dedicated to um, player development and really works with our, our development coaches in our first to third year players. And then we've got a, um, a part-time guy who comes in Monday, helps us manage our vision, capture vision, put into sports code packages, all that kind of stuff. And he also is part of our six to eight man match day stats team. Um, the most recent, um, my most recent role is information management. And this has really come up in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, last season we had a new coach. Our old coach got fired unexpectedly and a new coach has come in, Ross Lyon. Um, he came from St Kilda and his demand on everyone involved in the football, football department was a lot more than we were used to, a lot more than our, our previous coach. 
our new coach, he's the first one in the office, he's the last one to leave. And um, yeah, just the, just the demand from him for, on, on everyone is, is it's skyrocketed. And, and because of that, we do a lot more coding. Um, and we get information, we get a lot of different sources. We get it XMLs, CSVs. Um, a lot of the stat information we get from our stat provider now comes in Excel files. Um, a lot of our coaches and analysts have come from different backgrounds and they've got a lot of different coding techniques and habits. Uh, a lot of habits are good, some are bad. Um, we get a lot of vision from different sources and that's coming in different frame sizes, different codecs, different data rates, different frame rates. And it's been my job to, um, you know, to, to bring it all together. So what, what actually do I mean by a framework? Um, and it's kind of a word, I hadn't really thought about defining this before I was asked to present. Um, so it's a kind of word I've come up um, with to describe currently where I'm at with, with trying to manage a lot of people coding and, and trying to get their database, the information databased and, and ready for season analysis. So this is a sentence I've, I've come up with. It's using the tools available in sports code along with a set of rules, conventions and procedures to develop a con consistent workflows that can be used to collect, validate and analyse large amounts of information. So I'll just... Um, I'll just give you a, a, an idea of um, an, an output window of, of, of that's kind of got everything in it that we're trying to achieve with, with everyone that codes in our football department. So this is just a reference database for something we code regularly. Um, it's called Output Chains. So it's pretty much every chain of play that we've had this database is just our games. So it's every chain of play that we've had this year or up until round 18. We haven't got round 19 in here yet. Uh, we just played that game before I flew out. Um, so there's about 4,000 instances on this line. Um, hopefully this fits on the screen pretty much. Um, so this is, this is an output window which um, we kind of built to it was kind of a prototype window to, to show kind of how we wanted to manage information. So we could show the coaches and we can let them know where we're going with, with their coding and our analyst coding. And we wanted to get a real consistent feel for, for how we analysed information. So um, this, this is really just all broken down. Like in football, there's pretty much three types of chains. We get possession gain chains, so it's when you get the ball from a turnover. We have stoppage chains, so that's a neutral play, like a ball up in basketball and from a kick in. So when the opposition scores a point, you bring the ball in from your defensive goal line. Um, so this, this window kind of breaks everything down by field zones and um, gives the, the coaches an opportunity to look at um, a different scoring change from different field zones. And down the bottom here, where it says parameters, these are all the different filters that we can, we can search this information on. So this database is just Fremantle, um, but if the, you can use this output window for any, we database a whole lot of other teams as well. So you can, you can right click, I'll just go into thought mode. You can right click and you can rename all the different teams. And you can choose if you want to look at a specific opponent, you can choose what opponent you want to look at. Um, you can choose if you want to look at the last three rounds. You can choose if you just want to look at the first quarter, second quarter, first half. Um, if you just want to look at games that we've won, games that we've lost, you can change it from totals to, to averages. Um, and we can change the field zone. So we want to compare what's going on in our def defensive 50, what's going on with the opposition's forward 50, how we're, our backs versus forwards going, or we compare our D50 with the, opposition, with the opposition's D50 to see how they've been moving the ball out of their D50 compared to how we have. Um, and it's, we've got 18 games in here, and it still runs, there's a lot of scripting involved here, but we've, we've tried to make it as efficient as possible because our goal is we want to be able to analyse every game that's played um, throughout the season. So it's all linked to vision, so um, I'll just go through some, just quickly show you a couple of uh, um, centre bounces. So centre bounce is the start of a, a game or it, after a goal's been kicked, we'll come back to a centre bounce. So it's just giving you a bit of an idea about what Australian rules football is if you've never seen it before. That's Michael Walters, he goes on to kick the goal. 
Just another one. That's our captain, Matthew Pavlich. And he goes to kick out. I'll just show you one more. So the coaches often use this information to, it's a basis for their, how they're going to analyse our game and review our game. It just gives them an idea of where to start to look. Um, we've got benchmarks of where we want to score from certain zones and if we're not meeting those, they, they, can, they can go further and they can look into it a bit more. But he goes on to, to kick the goal as well. So this is kind of, the, this is kind of what, um, whoever's coding in our footy department, we want to, with their coding, we want to be able to produce this kind of output. Um, so I just quickly want to just go through how, how analysis has evolved since I've been at the football club um, since January of 2009. Um, when I got to the club, there was a real heavy reliance on stat reports from our stat providers. Um, there was really little to no work being done on our own custom reports, our own custom analysis. Um, our, match day, <laughs> our match day stats team, they were recording on pen and paper. And at this stage, um, this is come some examples. We'd had, the club had had sports code for two years. Um, and they were still doing this when I got to the club. I got to the club in January and we started playing games in February. And I didn't have a lot of experience for its, in this area. So it took pretty much towards the end of the season for us to start using sports code for our manual stats team. So it's, it's actually quite funny that um, I'd actually forgotten that we used to do that. Um, so we, when I got to the club, there was really just a basic use of sports code. There was little to no labelling, no flagging, there was no sorter windows, no stat windows. Sports code really was only used by the coaches to produce instances for, for team meetings. And at the end of the team meeting, we'd copy the vision to the server, but that was it, that was forgotten. Um, there was no, no stats coded by the coaches really to that were ever linked to vision. Um, we couldn't database anything. We couldn't do any analysis really on, on what they were coding. And at this stage, they didn't want us. There was at this stage there was two, there was me and another guy there, and we weren't allowed to code games back then. We would, um, we yeah, it was, we were just there to support them, and we really didn't do any coding. Um, it was pretty lucky we had, at the time, we had an assistant coach called Chris Scott. He's since moved on to be the senior coach for Geelong and in his first year they went on and won a premiership. And he was an assistant coach but I see him really as the first, you know, um, performance analyst that we had at the club. He really drove sports code. He was on the phone to Rex um, Proctor more than, more than I was and um, he was coming to me saying, how come we're not using the sorter window? What's going on with the sorter window? And like he really drove me to to get on top of things and to be able to deliver the information to him. Um, and that's really the foundations of, for, for me for, to, to realise the potential of, of sports code and what, what performance analysis was. So who, who uses sports code? Pretty much everyone in the footy department that has a Mac has sports code on it. Um, we've got over 30 staff and 45 players that use sports code. All our players have a MacBook Pro and have sports code on it. Um, so the people who code, uh, coaches, performance analysts, development, um, opposition scouts, they have a laptop with, uh, with sports code. Even our fitness and physios are starting to use it, mainly in pre-season, but um, they don't have a lot of time um, during the year. But they're, they're interested to work out how they can incorporate it more into, into their roles. Um, and recruiting, all our recruiters um, use sports code. So we've got, our, our players are like, they're the beginners. Um, they really don't do any coding. They're just using it to review vision. But some of them have started, they, they'll code their own edits, some of them just for highlight tapes, just you know, to show off. But some of them are actually using it for development. They're actually finding edits that, you know, where they can improve and, and they want to you know, keep a track of, of their development. Um, I'm going to quickly, I might come back to this if I've got some time at the end, Sports Code on Match Day. I've had a lot of questions, a lot of people ask me about how we use Sports Code on Match Day. It's not the only tool we use on Match Day, but it's... Um, it's the main tool we use. So this is just our sports code setup for match day, for home games. So on top of this, we have our software we get from our stats provider, and we also have our rotation software. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. If anyone's got some questions at the end, feel free to come up to me and, 
um, I'll, I'll take them through our match day setup. Um, I just want to point out the stats box. Um, that's our manual stats team. So we pair guys up. We have a coder and a caller. So one guy's coding, um, and then another guy is just calling. So the, the, the coder's just punching in numbers. He's not watching the game. Um, and that, that information comes in through an XML through the coder server and goes through to our, our three capture machines. And then we've got um, the ability to all, all the coaches can review vision. They get, all the coaches have a stack timeline share. Um, it does get used a lot. Um, the head coach will often ask a line coach a question about something he's seen and wants to confirm it. And the, uh, the assistant coach will go, yeah, I'm not sure. And the senior coach will go, well, you got vision in front of you? And the coach will go, yep. And he goes, well, use it. So they'll always got their head in the computer reviewing vision. So it gets used a lot. And for our home games, quickly, we've got a, everything's joined by a gigabit network. Our meeting room, the doctor's room, the stats box. So we've got a laptop in the meeting room, which is linked, has a, we, we uh, remote in into a timeline chair. So when the coaches get down there at half time, um, they've got everything we've coded is all there ready for them to go. We'll have a movie org up of the stuff they've requested um, to show the players. But if they want to get to any, 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 of the, any of the coding that we've done during the game, it's all there ready for them to go. And we'll have a laptop to go out onto the ground as well um, at quarter time and three quarter time. There's about a five minute break at quarter time and three quarter time. Um, and it's still enough time to show one or two edits to the player. And that's, again, that's the full, that'll be the full game um, st stacked and with a movie org of the stuff they've requested to show. Uh, away games is a bit different. We don't have the, the network, so we can't, we don't have the, the laptop in the rooms. So we have to take one down at the breaks. But the key difference here is our stats team don't travel. Um, they'll code, they'll come into our, into our um, office in Fremantle. We've got a big TV they'll sit in front, front of, same code, windows, everything, and they'll code there, and that information will come through live into the coach's box. But we've run in, I'll come, come on to that a bit later. Um, we've run into a couple of problems there. Okay, so the problems I've had to overcome. Um, so the main one is just the number of people coding. So the more people coding have come in consistent workflows. I said everyone's got their own kind of techniques and habits. Um, and it's some are good, some are bad. Um, there was not really any time spent um, design and planning um, of how the information was going to be analysed. Um, it was always often like a concept. The coaches would come with a concept and people would start coding it. And it wasn't you know, fully thought out of exactly how and who was going to do the analysis. Um, so the, yeah, the code, a lot of time the code would be using a code window for a couple of weeks and the coaches would come in and say, oh, can we do this, can we do that? You add a few more labels to it, and by that time it's around six, and you've got six different versions of the data, and you can't really um, analyze it. And it was, the, it was really hard to get the coaches to start thinking about long-term analysis. They were really week to week. And they focused really on reviewing the game, um, reviewing the, previewing the opposition, and it really wasn't how we're going to use the information you've coded this week, how we're going to use that later in the season, how we're going to use that to make decisions. Um, based on the game plan and player development. There was little to no error checking or fixing of coding mistakes. Guys would code games and they'd use the excuse, oh, I didn't really have time to go back and correct them. Um, it, became, it's, it became really impossible to check and manage all the coding that was being done um, by the football department. And that's, that's the main reason that's driven this um, development of this framework. And, these rules and conventions to try and educate the coaches, coaches to use. Um, we've, got, we've got each week, there's five, co like every coach codes game. Every coach will code the game. So we've got, we've got five coaches, and then we've got five analysts. They'll do coding as well. Then we've got five development coaches. They, all, they code not only the AFL game, but they also code our waffle games, which is a state league where our, um, our, players, our reserve players will play. And um, it's just became that hard because they... We didn't want them to be responsible for, for the databasing and the checking of errors. That's got to be done by us. Um, we don't want that to take up their time. And it just became a full-time job just managing the information. So we, we had to do something about it. Um, some of the common mistakes I just see people making with information management. Um, adding codes and labels to code windows without much, much thought. Coaches were just, oh, I've got to code this, add a code button. Oh, I just need this label, add another label button, won't put it in a group. Um, and it, it just makes it really, really hard for us to, 
to manage their information and to use that for, for long-term analysis. Um, too many codes. It took a while to get the coaches to, to use labels. Um, it's really only been late last year and this year. Um, Mick, the stuff that he presented on last year, he came in, uh, sorry, what Mick presented yesterday. Um, early this year he came in, we went through that stuff with the coaches and the coaches really loved it and that's, that's developing. Um, but the coaches traditionally would rather have, instead of having one code with seven labels, they'd rather have seven codes. They just wanted everything on, on separate lines. And that makes it really hard to produce output windows and search the data and it makes it really, really hard for, for long-term analysis. So there's just, yeah, there's just no thought for long-term ana analysis. And there's no consistency with naming conventions. Um, sometimes coaches would um, code the same thing each week and each week they'd have a new name for it. So i just go back to the definition. Um, that's, I mean, that, this was the goal and, and it's, it's my job now to, to educate the coaches and how to and how to use this, and I'll take you through exactly what this is. Um, but we only started using, and this is all based around Sports Code Nine. We only started using Sports Code Nine, I think, in, in February this year. Um, and so it's it's been this has been what we've been developing this year, and we we plan to put it into full effect um, during the preseason. So what are the tools available? Um, we got code windows, output windows, all the features you know, rename CSV, sorter. Um, save searches, matrix, XML import, ex import, export, CSV, import, export, vision databases. Um, so these are some of the rules that I've come up with to educate our analysts and our, and our coaches. Um, all the labels, groups and codes must follow the strict naming conventions. And we've got CSVs for everything, um, which we will use in the code windows. Uh, code windows must include the mandatory groups and labels. I'll come to these in a sec, but everything we code has to include these set, these set of labels. Um, output windows, same, them, you've, you've got a plan to, to be able to filter the information. So there's some examples that, that we, we should include. Um, all coding methods must include uh, method, uh, methods for identifying errors. Um, if it's regular coding, if it's something we code every week, it's all got to be data-based. I mean, this stuff sounds, might sound pretty simple for you, but for coaches, um, they don't even want to think about this stuff. So it, it makes it quite difficult. Um, and databasing. Um, this is a big one. Um, after, after stuff's database, it's got to be, the database has to be validated to make sure the information in the database is correct. If the wrong games haven't been databased or um, games haven't been databased in the wrong order, etc. Um, so this is some just some examples of the naming conventions we have. There's CSVs for all these. These are just some of them. But um, we're building on this all the time. Whenever we come with more something new that we're analysing, we'll come up with naming conventions for it. We won't just wait until we build a code window. Um, that's part of the planning process. Mandatory groups. So these are the groups that will appear. Any coding that's done in our footy department now, all these will be on it. And these are the basis for the parameters and search filters. So the team, who they're playing, what round it was, what the result of the game was, what the, the period was, so we've got four quarters in football, uh, the venue, and who coded it. Um, we've got, we're actually probably building on these for next year. We've already got a few ideas for some additional ones we, which we want to add to this. Um, so some more of the rules. All labels must be grouped. A set of labels must be defined for each group. One label per group where instance, uh, one label per group per instance where possible. Um, if you've got two, my philosophy is if you've got two labels in one group, you probably need two groups. There are exceptions for this. Um, it just makes it easier to search and analyze the data. Um, each instance must contain a label for each group where possible. I don't like um, a, a, a code or an instance missing a label that all its other instances have. Um, it's hard to tell if, if that was missed as a label or it didn't have the label. Um, so you can't really check, you can't use any data validation on that. Um, so you, you've got to take into account, when you're designing your code windows, you've got to take into account error checking and uh, validation. 
So these are the uh, the six the six steps for um, designing the information. <clears throat> the first stage, it's it's coming up with how you want to how you want your information to look, how you want to analyze it. Um, I don't want to go to the code window until that's that's not till stage three. Stage two, design the sorter window. That might sound a bit weird, but I'll get to that shortly. Um, so stage one. So it's, it's, it starts off with identifying the information you want to analyze. Um, you've got to avoid the desire to, to jump straight into a code window. Um, you don't even need sports code for this step. Just use a pen and paper, Photoshop, Keynote. You can use sports code, but um, you're just trying to come up with a visual representation of the information you, you, you risk to cap you capture. Uh, the coaches always rush into this, so it's, it's hard to, to get them to sit down with you and, and actually plan out. Um, they're quite busy, they want to spend time with the players, um, there's not much time during the week. We travel every second week, there's a lot of excuses, but um, it's, it's quite important. Um, and you've got to include how you want to filter that information, what parameters you want to, you want to search. And it must meet the, min the minimum requirements defined by the framework. So this is, the, this is what we, the one I, I um, showed you earlier. So we've got the parameters on there. Um, this is a, the same, different layout. This is kind of the first layout we, we came up with. Um, we actually have this built as an output window as well. Um, this has a little bit more information on it, but we use sometimes when the coaches get more specific. Um, but it's got, you can see it's got the same filters. Works the same way. Um, so once you've got that ready, you, you go into your sorting, uh, you're designing your sorter window. And this is just um, turning your, app, your output window into what you want your sorter window, window to look like. So after you've coded it, what's your sorter window going to look like? Um, so you're defining what codes, what groups, and what sets of labels you're going to have for each of those groups. The common mistakes is to use too many codes. From an information management point of view, the less codes we have, the better. Um, you've got to try and work out where you're going to get overlap in your code. Sometimes it's hard to work out, but wherever you're going to get overlap, that's where you, you come up with a second code. And for us, that's often on, um, you know, sometimes you're coding stuff by field zone. Um, you may need, need uh, multiple codes. Uh, the other time is when you have different sets of label information, so you're going to need two codes. Um, save searches. Um, from once you've got your set of information coded on your one line, you can produce multiple lines from save searches. Save searches aren't used enough. Um, they were talking about it um, earlier. Uh, someone, yeah, it's it's one of the most powerful tools I think in, in sports code, and it's underutilized. Again, the sorter window must meet the minimum requirements requirements defined by the framework. So, kind of, this is just a simple example of like a design of what your sorter window should look like. You've got your groups and your codes, and then your sets of labels. It's a little bit confusing. The red the red spots are where those codes don't need those those labels. I'll just jump ahead. So this is the, the sort of design for that first output window I demonstrated. Um, as you can see, we've got the code names, just output chains, and then everything in orange, that's all the, the mandatory groups. So we've all got CSVs defined for it all. So that, no matter what sort of window you're going to design, all that information is going to be there for everything you design. Um, then the stuff in the green, that's the stuff where we want to analyze. So we're doing chains of play. So Again, all, those, all that information there we have defined in CSVs. Um, with the result, with that the score sources window, we're really only looking at scores. So we really only need goals behind. But why not just put in the full set of data for that result? Because we can use that for a lot of other output windows. Um, so for me, this is the design document. When someone can come to me with this, I can produce a code window that's going to produce the information they want. From this, I can work out how I'm going to script the output window, how the out output window is going to work. This document, this is the, the most important part to make sure that going forward, right from the go, as soon as we start coding games, we're going to be coding um, the correct information for the, for the coach um, and that, um, or they're going to be, they'll end up using this code window, so we're going to be producing the information they want. If this isn't designed properly, they're going to be coming back to you going, oh, can you add in this group, can you add in this label, I need this extra code, and it's going to set you back. 
and it's the most frustrating thing for, for my analysts, my team, um, to have the coaches come back and have to change their output windows five or six times. Um, so stage three is um, building the code window. Um, you, your work's pretty much done. Once you've got your output and your sorted design done, you know the number of codes you're going to have, you know the number of groups, how many groups, uh, the, how many labels you're going to have for each, each group. Um, but what we've done is the framework, we've provided templates um, for people to use to make code windows. We don't want people to go in sports code file new code window. Um, we want them to start with one of the templates we use. And I'll just quickly, I just want to quickly go through and show you uh, one template, which is the stuff I'm going to show you today with the code windows. These are the, the prototypes we made. So that we've, we've got some that are more designed around our game plan analysis. These are just more, these are more of a concept. Is, would this work? How could we use it? Um, so as you can see here, um, in the bottom left-hand corner there, we've got, um, that's all the mandatory groups. So on every code window we produce, this, this, this window is here. And that's all, I'll just go into report mode. All re everything's renameable. The coaches don't need to, we've got everyone, every, these are all the people who code. Um, they don't need to, um, don't need to edit the buttons. Just rename everything that you're about to code. So we've got all the venues in here. Um, what they're coding, are they coding an AFL game? Are they coding a pre-season AFL game? Is it just pre-season, normal pre-season game? Or is it training? Now with, with these generic groups and labels, they're all renameable. So you can right click on the group. We've got a set of groups that we use. Again, these were just the prototypes we came up with. Our, the, the actual ones we use, I'm, I'm not showing you today, but these gives you an idea of, you can come up with, if you've really defined your game plan and how you want to play, you, you should be able to put everything in that, you, that anyone could be coding. Um, so you can, for just for example, um, on the output window we did, we need, we need to code um, who our opponent was. Um, so I think we've got that in common, we've got opponent there. And then we had, um, it's got to be the opponent, so that'll be Richmond. And you can go through. And when you change the group, the group name, that changes automatically changes the group for all these labels. So you don't need to go in the inspector and change the groups. That's done automatically. So coaches can actually start to, to make their own code windows themselves. They can change their labels. Um, they don't need to know the details about um, all the all the you know linking and all that kind of stuff. All the linking's done. And then if they don't need these, if they don't, go back to edit mode, if they don't need these, um, just delete them. So they don't need to start a, a code window from scratch. Our analysts don't need to, to start their code window from scratch. The idea is to build a whole set of templates that, so that we can produce code windows rapidly and output windows rapidly. Um, we don't have to start them from scratch. So during the season, we don't have much time. We travel every second week. We'll travel on the Thursday, get back on the Sunday. Um, we really want to be spending our time analyzing the data. We don't want to be spending our time building output windows and code windows. So that's just an example of, of a, a simple template. So I'm just going to go ahead to, I want to come back to code windows, but um, I'm just going to jump ahead to how do you add error checking and validation to your code windows. So it's got a couple of definition, definitions. Error checking is putting into place methods during coding that will help minimize coding errors. And validation is using sports code tools such as output windows to easily identify coding errors, coding errors during live coding and post coding. Um, this is for us. This is most useful live. Um, I talked about our manual stats team, um, how they're based in in Perth for when we play in the state. And this has worked pretty well for a couple of years. Um, but what we found now is. There's a lot of blind time for them, so they, they, they're coding off a uh, broadcast feed live in, um, and the broadcasters will often cut to coach's box or they'll cut to the crowd, they'll cut to the bench if someone's injured while the, while the game's going. And this, is, this has gotten to a point now where it's, it's during the season it's actually become a problem for us where 
Um, we've actually got to the point now where we've got the guys coding blind time so we can actually see like ha ha how many minutes per game they're, we're, you know, we're losing data for. Um, so this error validation, error checking is actually coming quite useful this year. Um, so we achieved this through code window design and output window design to report on errors. Um, so I'll quickly come and show you the, the toggle code window. So I've left all the, the icons and all the buttons so you can see what type of buttons they are. So up the top here, this is all, these are all toggle windows up here. So this is where the, the user would be coding the information. Again, this is just a prototype window. This is this was, uh, what we used to define the concept and, and how it would work. And then every, uh, again, you've seen this before, this here is the, the, the mandatory labels and everything that we, we, we require, require for every code window. And then the other stuff is output. So here's an error log. So this will, this will update when there's coding mistakes. So you'll be able to see what instance there's an error on. Here, this is just a, a log of um, what's currently being coded and what's previously been coded. So these are, that's the actual code button there, and these are the actual label buttons. So I'll just open up some vision and just give you an example of how it works. Oops. So um, these are different, different uh, chains of play. So we're going to code a possession gain. All right, it was Fremantle. It was forward 50. Um, it was a goal. So the end zone automa automatically gets set for 450 because if it's a score, the end zone's got to be 450. So down here, all this information is updated automatically based on the, um, the, the toggle we've pressed. Um, and the advantages of this is that the, the coder can, can see what they've coded, uh, they can see what labels they've hit. The labels actually ha haven't gone on the code yet. Um, you can even change the code name. If you wanted to, whoops, there was actually a stoppage. You can actually change the, the, the code. Um, and it just, it takes away some of the errors. So you can't accidentally press a, a label too early and then, um, or you can't accidentally press it twice and you haven't realized you've pressed it twice. Um, it takes some of the error out, which is what we want to do. And once, you've, once you're comfortable with all the, the labels you've got in, you just need to apply the, and that actually puts the code down. So there's, there's the code. So how this works for, for errors is, all the labels have default values. So they're all defaulted to error. So if I was to code a possession gain and forget to do something, forget to do the result and code it, as you can see, the result here is still error. So when I apply the code, it gets the, the result group, the label for the result group goes down as an error. And this is telling me here that on the second instance, on the possession gain code line, there's an error on that instance. And it, it works for um, the, the, the reason we have the orange unknown buttons, that's mainly came into for our, our manual stats team. So when they're watching their broadcast feed and it, the, it cuts to the coach's box and they can't see the start zone, you know, they can, they can just code it as unknown. And then, then they can code the rest of the information. Whoops, what happened there? Oh yeah, sorry. Let's try that again. I didn't hit unknown. So they don't know the start zone get all the other information in there, and it comes up orange. So this is really useful for me. So my, my role on match day is, is to call out stats for the coaches when, when needed. If they ask for a stat, I'll, I'll let them know what's going on. Um, but I'm there to troubleshoot. I'm there to make sure our match day setup runs smooth. And what I have, I have these, I can have these output windows open so I can see the errors as they're coming in from our, from our, um, our coders. So I can either try and fix them straight away. I can just alert the coaches um, of the, the errors on some of the numbers, but I definitely get it fixed at the breaks. I'll get the errors fixed. Um, we, get, we get different angles. We get a, a side on angle, so we get 100% of the, uh, the view, so I can go back and anything that was unknown because they couldn't see, I can go back and I can find and I can correct. So when the information is going to the coaches at later breaks or when they get home to code the game um, after the game, uh, it's the information is, is accurate and correct. And without these output windows, it's really hard for us to find the time before delivering the coaches the, the game to take home to, to fix. This gives me the ability to, to rapidly fix the errors um, in the short breaks that we, that we get. 
Um, so that's, that's how that window works. Um, and I mean, this is a pretty simple window, but we do a lot of simple coding and, and this makes it, it, it really useful. But these concepts can be applied to very, very complex code windows. Um, we also have, I'll just bring up a different timeline. Like safe searches, all these safe searches are based on the, the defined groups and label names, et cetera, that we use that are defined by the CSVs. So if one coach is coaching something for, on chains and they want to look at D50 transition, and another coach is doing the same thing and they're using the same group names but they're coding different information, they can both use the same safe search or I can use the same safe search to find information. And we can also use the safe searches to search for, for errors. So if I want to find all the errors that have been coded on, on a line that I need to go back and fix, I can do it this way. Um, don't have to use an output window. Uh, an output window will give you a good summary of, of what's there but you can also use, use the safe searches. And Specific to rows, like we just want to look at possession gain, a different safe search. It'll just find the ones on, on, on that row. So that's, that's the data validation, like in, at design time, um, when you're designing your code windows, to have those labels in there to detect errors. So I've gone through most of the, you know, the advantages of using the toggles. Um, for me, it's just another way to, to try and make the, the coding more accurate. Um, so setting up your databases, um, all our databases, all our information gets databased into reference databases that reference all our game packages. Um, and they, they all stay on the server. Um, there's a couple of things we need to take into consideration. Uh, with with the, the, the game, the game uh, filters like to look at the last three games, the last five games, or the whole season. We do that using the scripting, the start and end time to get the start time of the first instance, the end time of the last instance, and then to use those um, time codes to, to do the counts and etc. Um, the only way that works if the games are databased in you know chronological order. So round one, round two, round three. We don't want people databasing round one, round two, round three, round five, and then realizing oh, sh forgot to database round four, then databasing round four. Um, that won't work with our output windows, so we need ways to, to um, make sure our, to validate the database has the correct information in it. And it's quite easy when, when our analysts are databasing a whole lot of information on a Monday, it's quite easy for, to lose concentration to accident, accidentally database the wrong game. Or, um, it's, so we need, we need ways to make sure this isn't happening. It's the human error side of things, so we can't just ignore it and pretend it's not happening. We need ways to, to look at it. Um, and averages was a big challenge for us as well because um, we want to look at the times we've won over a, over a certain range of games. It was quite difficult to, to get to work efficiently and accurately um, across the, the code row with all the, all the information on it. So what we do, we kind of cheat a little bit. We import an XML that's got all the results. Um, let's quickly show you. It's got all the results on a separate line, and that needs to be updated in the database each week. So this is the database I opened up at the start of the presentation. So as you can see, that output chains line there, that's, that's every chain we've had this year, and then we've got the results line. So if you open up this results line, um, this is every result for every team played, not just our games, it's every team. So the first game played this year was Adelaide versus Essendon. Adelaide lost, Essendon won, so they've got a one there. We haven't actually got the venues in here yet, um, but we're working on that. Um, so that, that's how we work out how many games we need to divide the totals by to work out the averages for our, our, our output windows. So database validation, so we have an output window to validate our databases. So all you do is open up your, open up your database, make sure you've got the right team selected and the right, right code line. and. Red is bad, green is good. So it's saying there, there's no round 11 in our database. We had to buy round 11, so that's okay. Um, this column here will go red if a round's been databased out of order. If there's any, any, round, any, any quarters missing from a game, 
they'll go red. Um, we're running database up to up to round 18, so um, we. And you can also use this before the game's a database to make sure label uh, quarters have been labelled correctly. Um, you don't um, before so, so before you database it. We encourage people to use this as well on their on their coding just to make sure everything's everything's fine. Now I'll give you a, this actually happened. This I'll open up a a database. That, this actually happened, so we were data, the validation window was something we've only done recently. Um, so as you can see, round seven, I think that was against Collingwood, um, there's no quarter one labels in the database. They actually got, you can see there for quarter two, there's 108 instances. That's a lot. And it turned out that qu uh, quarter one actually got labeled as quarter two. So we'd been we'd been using this database for a couple of weeks before we found out that um, that was done that way. So that's how that's how the, the data validation works for a database. Um, so pretty much gone through all that stuff. Um, So that's what we're checking with the the app that we know there for database validation. Make sure all the games have been databased correctly in the, in the right order, um, that all periods have been databased, and that the latest results XML has been updated. So the workflow is pretty simple. Um, it's your standard workflow that you would have. You'd code a game, but with just the added steps, you've got to check the error, check the errors, and validate your coding. Um, once that's done, we use our safe searches to generate sub rows for the coaches that they can use to for their analysis, and then you can do your game analysis on it. Then, that, then you database it, and validate your database. The only the, the key steps here are the two and six. It's really the checking for errors to make sure um, <coughs> your coding is valid and making sure the database gets updated correctly. Um, so that's that's the presentation. Any. Any questions? I've got one back here. Yep. So regardless of how many code windows you use or how many members of your staff you have, it seems like there's two, um, you know, and everyone sits in this room and we're always evolving our code window and we're always adding to it, making it more efficient and adding data. But then the other side is this piece where we want to be consistent in the data that we collect in order to proper anal properly analyze that data. I mean, if you're constantly changing what you're coding, then there's a problem in validating that data. So how often are you adding and changing and evolving that code window? I mean, once the season starts, is that it? That's my philosophy is once the season starts, we should be set with how we uh, want to analyze our, our season. And so that's, that means you've got to spend time in your preseason coming up with you know, how you're going to analyze your season. I don't want to be making changes round two, round three, round five. Um, our coach has a real structured game plan. Like he knows how he wants to play football. And we're kind of lucky because that's easy. You know, that's kind of easy to model type thing. Um, but I, I'd rather have less information but more accurate information over a longer period of time than because I think that's more useful than changing stuff because then you're, you're compromising your um, your analysis, like you're, you're breaking it down, and, and you've got to, you've, it's fine if you want to go back and recode games. If you've got the resources to change your code window around 10 and then go back and recode or relabel games, I mean, I'd, I'd be all for that, but we just don't have the resources to do that. So I really want to be locked off early in the preseason. A lot of our training drills um, we'll use the same code windows for. So during the preseason, we've got the opportunity to to test out our code windows and our analysis on our preseason to make sure it's going to work right in um, going forward through the season. And it's been real difficult to do that pre version 9. Like Sports Code version 9 for me, um, it's, it's a whole new piece of software. It makes a version 8. But yeah, it's, I, haven't been, I don't think I've been able to do my job properly before version 9, to be honest. So version 9's been, yeah, I've been waiting for it for a while. Any other questions? Yep. Um, you talked about the coaches being the main coach. Yep. Are they coding in game and or after the game? Without giving space for extra analysis, what about the coach? Are they coding whatever they want to? Or are they coding what the team wants to see them on? Or just the general 
Yep, they, none of the coaches will code live during a game. Um, they will all code the game post. Uh, they, the, the coaches will have the Monday off, um, so they'll do all their coding on, on the Monday, and then they'll come in on the Tuesday. Um, everything they like, uh, everything they code is all pretty much game plan related. And Ross is the senior coach. He's very clear about what the game plan is, um, which was very new to me. The previous coach wasn't that clear, so it, it's it's very clear for them what they need to be need to be coding, and it, it's. It's, it's normally pretty consistent, but again, when they come up with new ideas and new concepts, it can, it can put a spanner in the works and it makes it quite difficult for us. But um, I mean, it, I think it's my role to educate the coaches in how, how the analysis kind of works and, and what we're trying to achieve, which will help them. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's their, they're, they're, they are pretty consistent with, with what they code. Do they have their own code? Yes. With not all of them, at the moment, n most of them don't. We're, like, we only started using Sports Code version 9 in, in February or March this year. So this has been a system we've been developing this year, and, and we're slowly changing our output windows over, changing our code windows over. The coaches are the hardest ones to, to get at and to change over, but we, we, have, we have started. Any other questions? Uh, if, yeah, feel free to come up and um, yeah, see me if you've got any, any other questions later or if you're interested on our match day setup, just yeah, come and ask. But yeah, thank you and thanks to Sports Tech for inviting me.